Well, good afternoon, loved ones. It's good to see you all here today. What a privilege we have every week to meet together and fellowship with one another. You must remember there are those who cannot meet freely, and we need to keep those Christians in our prayer. Now, I'm sure last year we'll have historians talking for a long, long time. If 2020 was a test for Christians, Christian America, I would say we failed miserably. 2020 showed us a major lack of theological and doctrinal understanding, not only by many church elders, but also by Christians themselves. The lack of Christian patience and understanding was astounding. As a divided nation itself, it, confusion reigned in places that we should have been able to trust. What was more obvious was a lack of biblical clarity on many issues, including everything from protest movements to riots, to whether taking the vaccine was a moral or Christian obligation. Now, Richard and I were really surprised at the lack of biblical understanding to fight against the governmental overreach of closing our churches. While Romans 13 teaches us to submit to governing authorities, we must always remember Christ is above all earthly powers. Somewhere along the way, we lost the faith to persevere. We lost trust in the Lord God above and we forgot to love one another. Christians of the first century met in secret because the Romans would put them to death if they found out. They met despite being persecuted by the government. We freely disbanded our churches and Sunday schools. We disbanded our fellowship. We feared the coronavirus more than we feared God's retribution. America, Christian America, broke God's fourth covenant, commandment. Because Christian America feared COVID-19 more than they feared God. You know, our money says on it, in God we trust, but it should read, in COVID we fear. Richard and I have prayerfully continued to search God's holy word for guidance through these issues, and we, as a congregation, must continually be diligent and examine God's holy word so that we can faithfully engage the world that is becoming increasingly hostile to the gospel message. Now, America may have been founded on Christ Christian values, but the gospel message got lost somewhere along the way. The passage we're about to read could be titled, Jesus Begins His Great Galilean Ministry. The section of Matthew that starts with chapter 4, verse 12, and goes all the way through to chapter 25, verse 46, is topical rather than chronological, and Matthew features Jesus' sermons and his gospel message. The record of Jesus' actions is interspersed with the great passages of his teaching, his gospel message. Matthew records for us his Sermon on the Mount and his parables of the kingdom. Jesus taught about faith and repentance and forgiveness and redemption and reconciliation and salvation justification and sanctification, and ultimately glorification. This is the gospel message. So let's turn together in Matthew 4, to Matthew 4, and we'll look at verses 12 through 17 as we look at God's holy word together. Matthew 4, verses 12 through 17. Verse 12. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went to live in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah, land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, 
the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, the Galilee of the Gentiles. The people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. And from that time on, Jesus began to preach, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Now, like Richard said, today we'll focus on verse 17 and what all it means. But to give us a little perspective, we'll look quickly at verses 12 through 16 to see how this particular passage starts. And we must remember that when we look at just one verse, we need to look at it in the context of the passage. So here we see Jesus starting his ministry to mankind because he came into the world to preach his great gospel message. And in verse 12, Jesus hears of John's imprisonment. So he goes into the countryside. Remember, John the Baptist was the one who pointed to Christ and said, Behold the Lamb of God. Christ was not ready to get tangled up in John's case, so Christ went into the countryside. Christ must have time to prepare. He also, also remember, John must decrease before Christ can increase. Otherwise, the minds of the people would have been distracted between the two. John must be Christ's herald, but not his rival. As Matthew Henry once said, the moon and the stars are lost when the sun rises. John had done his work. Christ then goes on to build upon the good foundation John the Baptist has laid. So he went to preach in a remote part of the countryside. In verse 13, we see he chose Capernaum for his residence, which is on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Lake of Gennesaret. This was his headquarters when he was in the area of Zebulun and Nephtali, which was just west of Galilee. Capernaum was on the north shore, seemed to be more welcoming than his hometown of Nazareth. In verse 14 through 16, we see the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled. Isaiah wrote in chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, he humbled Zebulun and the land of Nephtali, but in the future he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. We see in our gloom and despair, we fear our sorrows and troubles will never end. We can take comfort in this certainty, though, that although the Lord may not always take us around our troubles, if we follow him wholeheartedly, he will lead us safely through them. Because the baby child that was born became the Deliverer and the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Matthew wrote these verses in describing Christ's ministry here in verses 14 through 16. The territories of Zebulun and Nephtali represent the northern kingdom as a whole. These were the territories where Jesus grew up and often ministered. This is why they would see a great light. The Apostle John also often referred to Jesus as the light and in John 1, 9, and Jesus referred to himself as the light in, of the world in John 8, 12. In the times of darkness, God promised to send a light who would shine on everyone living in the shadow of death. Christ is both a wonderful counselor and a mighty God and a great light. This message of hope was fulfilled in the birth of Christ and the establishment of his eternal kingdom. He came to deliver all people from slavery to sin. So Christ, the great light, came to the area around Capernaum, Galilee, and the gospel came to all those places. 
The Son of Righteousness cast his great light. This light reveals the truth of the gospel, not like a candle would, but like the light of the sun would. The great light clarifies the law. So in the land of the shadow of death, the light has dawned. Isaiah also writes in chapter 42, verse 6, I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and the light of the Gentiles. And also in chapter 49, verse 6, I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that my salvation may reach the end of the earth. Now, I, I repeat this time several times, but this is because this theme was prophesied by Isaiah, one of the four major prophets of the Old Testament, many, many years before Christ was born. From the start, Christ, Christ preached the same message as John the Baptist. Repeat, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We see this in verse 17. The gospel is the same no matter who preaches it. The meaning and the instructions are the same. It is the everlasting gospel. Fear God and repent and give him honor. When Christ preached the same message as John, he confirmed he was the Messiah. There are many things Christ could have preached about. However, he delivered the same enduring text. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We as his people must speak the gospel truth always from our hearts and from our lips because the doctrine of repentance is still pertinent. And as Richard mentioned earlier, we preach this often, but it still remains relevant and pristine today. Even though it's been preached and heard often, it is extremely important that it is preached and understood again each time with new devotion. The doctrine of repentance is the correct gospel doctrine. Not only did John the Baptist preach it, but our Lord Jesus Christ preached repentance. What a privilege we have to be able to repent. Now the words kingdom of heaven in verse 17 has the same meaning as the kingdom of God that's used in Mark and Luke and John. Matthew, however, was a Jew and uses this phrase, the kingdom of heaven, because the Jews, out of their intense reverence and respect, did not pronounce God's name. Jesus started his ministry with the very words people that the people have heard from John the Baptist repent. The message was the same as, as it is today as it was when Jesus and John preached it. Because as a follower of Christ, it means we mean, need to turn away from our self-centeredness and return our self-control over to God for his direction and control. The kingdom of heaven is still at hand because it arrived in our hearts with the help of the Holy Spirit. God's present, God's presence, the kingdom of heaven, is still with us today because Jesus Christ reigns in our hearts. Jesus Christ reigns in the hearts of his believers. However, the kingdom of heaven will not fully be perceived, perceived, perceived until the evil in the world is judged and removed. Christ came to the earth first as a suffering servant. He will come again as a king and a judge to rule victoriously over all the earth. Today the second coming is closer than when Christ and John preached the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This means salvation is closer too. As Paul said in Romans 13 11, besides this you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. We should therefore 
revitalize our duties and accelerate our mercies as we see the day approaching. Remember what Hebrews 10.25 states, Not neglecting to meet together as the habit is of some, but encouraging one another and it all the more as we see the day drawing near. The day of that great white throne judgment is closer than we think. For we're a mere vapor that disappears in a breeze. Are you ready, beloved, for that day? The day of salvation is drawing near to us. Many of us may wonder how salvation works. What happens first? What happens second? And so forth. Well, the order of salvation, or the ordo salutis, as known in Latin, refers to a series of conceptual steps within the Christian doctrine of salvation. You can see them on your bulletin. And they come from Romans 8, verse 28 through 30. Let's turn there together. Turn to Romans 8, 28 to 30. And let me read it, and I'll explain as we go along. Romans 8, verse 28 through 30. Verse 28. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So let me explain that. We know with great confidence that God, who is deeply concerned about us, causes all things to work together according to his plan for the good of his people. Verse 29. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. I'll explain. God foreknew and loved and chose us before and beforehand and predestined us to be conformed to the image of Christ and ultimately one day share in God's Christ's complete sanctification. So that Christ would be the firstborn and that the most beloved and honoring among all people, but all of us who believe the same and have the same faith as Abraham will also share in that sanctification. Verse 30, And those he predestined he also called, and those he called he also justified, and those he justified he also glorified. So I'll explain that real quick. God predestined us and called us by his gospel message, by the evangelization of the gospel, and those that God called, those who heard and had faith in the gospel and repented, God also justified, declaring them free from guilt and sin. And those he justified, he also glorified and raised, is raising them to a heavenly dignity. In these consecutive steps, the Holy Spirit brings about the word, the work of salvation. It should be noted that these not be conceived as a chronological step. Many of these stages are seen as distinctions within a single process that all in one way or another depend upon the work of God. The concept of the ordered sequence of salvation was an important part of the construction of the Westminster Confession. Now repentance, our topic today, is a stage in the order of salvation, and in the Old Testament the term repentance comes from the word group, from the Hebrew word group, to turn away from. And in the New Testament, the, word, the Greek word group can also mean remorse, but is generally translated as a turning away from sin. 
theologically, repentance means a turning away from sin that is linked to a corresponding turn to faith in God. The order of salvation for us goes something like this. Foreknowledge, predestination, and election is God's knowing and choosing at the beginning of all time those who he would be saved, who he would save, long before they were born. Then comes evangelization, the communication of the gospel, regeneration, God turning a stony heart to flesh, faith, the belief in the gospel message, repentance, a turning away from sin, and a corresponding turning up towards faith in God, conversion, turning to God based on the gospel, perseverance, continually remaining faithful with the help of him who is able to keep us from stumbling and present us blameless, justification, God freeing us from the penalty of sin and pronouncing us not guilty, for we are now justified by Christ's blood. Then sanctification, God cleansing us from what is dishonorable and being set apart as honorable and holy. Then glorification, God's final removal of all sin from our lives, and after death giving us new bodies so that we may be with him forever in the eternal state. Now perseverance and justification come together very quickly, one right after the other. And perseverance and justification and sanctification are linked very closely together. The order of these and the importance of which happens first, I leave up to the theologians because their positions are hotly debated. All I know is, and all I can say with certainty is, that all of these steps must happen in order for salvation's plan to work. The last two stages, sanctification, full sanctification, and glorification, speak of future glory and the final reward. Repentance is therefore a necessary step in salvation and a part of the process of sanctification and ultimately glorification. Whether faith or repentance comes first is a topic of hot debate, as I said before. Thomas Watson wrote that he doesn't dispute the chronological order of whether faith or repentance comes first, but he's sure that repentance shows itself first in a Christian life. He says, though, that he he's apt to think that the seeds of faith are first formed in the heart. He uses an example of a burning candle in a dark room. When a burning candle is first brought into a dark room, the light shows itself first. But the candle was there long before the light. So we see the fruits of repentance first, but the beginnings of faith is there before. That makes one inclined to think that faith is summarily in the heart before repentance is, because repentance, being a grace from God, must be exercised by the one that is living. Therefore, there must be some seeds of faith in the heart of the penitent man. He also goes on to write that whether faith or repentance comes first, he's sure that repentance is, a, is of such importance that there is no one being saved without it. It is the great duty of every Christian to solemnly repent and turn to God. Repentance is a foundation grace. Faith which is built on that foundation, will never fall. We should note that repentance is also required under the gospel message. We see that Christ's first sermon, in fact, the first word of his first sermon, is repent. 
in verse 17. Also, when Christ gave his farewell statement, as he was going to ascend to heaven, his last message was that repentance should be preached in his name. That's Luke 24, 47. The apostles did just that. They went out and preached that man should repent. Mark 6, 12. Repentance is pure gospel message. Repentance came in by the gospel. Now, how is repentance ushered in, you might ask? The matter in which repentance is presented to mankind is twofold partly by word, and partly by the Spirit. The first, when the word is preached, God uses it to effect repentance. It is compared to a hammer and a fire in Jeremiah 23, 29. Is not my word like a fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks rocks to pieces? One to break the stony heart, the other to melt the heart. The second way is the Spirit in the Word illuminates and converts. When the Spirit touches a heart, it dissolves it to tears. Have you ever wondered why some grow better by the Word and others grow worse? The same earth which causes sweetness in the grape causes bitterness in wormwood. What's the reason the word works so differently? It's because of the Spirit of God that carries the word to the conscience of the repentant man and not to the unrepentant sinner. The road to hell is paved with the bones of the unrepentant. Now to have faith and repent, one must have knowledge of what to have faith in not necessarily understanding fully what it is, but you must know what you're having faith in. The order of salvation puts evangelism, regeneration, and faith, then repentance. I, like Watson, think the seeds of faith must be there in the heart first. However, evangelism is what makes the seed grow, the gospel message. So one could say you must know about God you must have the knowledge of God before you can have faith. You need to have the knowledge, but not necessarily the full understanding of it. However, you need to know what it is. That's why evangelism is so important. When the word is preached, God uses it to effect repentance. It's compared to a hammer in a fire in Jeremiah 23, 29. And it reminds me of a story from my past. Bear with me here. When I was a child playing in my father's workshop, my dad showed me my grandfather's hammer. My grandpa was a farmer and a part-time carpenter and an elder in his church. Dad put grandpa's hammer in my hand. It was old and beat up. The handle was black. It was stained with dirt and sweat, and it was heavy in my hand. Then he put his hammer in my hand. He said, this is my hammer. The hammer I used to build this house. My dad was a farmer, a diesel mechanic, and a part-time carpenter. His hammer was not as old and beat up as Grandpa's hammer, but it looked the same, and it was just as heavy as Grandpa's hammer. Then he said, one day you will have a hammer just like mine. At that very moment, I knew what a hammer looked like. Before that time, I didn't know what a hammer was or what it even looked like. Since I was a child, I still didn't know all the things a hammer could be used for. However, 
From that time on, when someone said the word hammer, I could picture it in my mind. I knew what a hammer was. If someone had a hammer in their hand, I could look at it and say, that's a hammer. When I was older, my father gave me a hammer, just like his, and I took it with me when I left home. I now know what a hammer looks like, and because I now have a hammer of my own, I will forever know what a hammer is. Knowledge leads to faith. Now when I hold a hammer in my hand, I can have faith that what I'm holding in my hand is a hammer. Before I was born, other people knew what hammers were. I had to be taught what a hammer was. As I grew up, I gained the understanding of all the things a hammer could do and how it could be used. If we use this story about the hammer as an allegory, the hammer would be the gospel. The gospel was around long before I was born. I had to be told what the gospel was. I had no knowledge of what the gospel was until I held it in my hand, or for lack of a better word, held it in my mind. I might have heard about the gospel, but I really didn't know until I had the knowledge of what the gospel was. I was ignorant of what the gospel could mean, or what the gospel could do, or how to even use the gospel. Once the gospel message, message was put into my hand, so to speak, I then could have faith that when I saw the gospel message, I knew what it was. When I heard the gospel message, I knew what it was. The faith from the knowing of the gospel, the beginnings of faith, were already there. However, repentance comes from hearing and knowing the gospel message. The gospel message, like a hammer, breaks up the stony heart and then builds the house of repentance. With the help of the Holy Spirit and the knowledge of the gospel, the stony heart is replaced with a heart of flesh. This is why evangelism is so important. This is why evangelizing the gospel is so important. How can you believe before you're shown? How can you believe before you hear? As Paul puts it in Romans 10, 13 and 14, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Verse 14, How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one who they've not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? Without someone preaching to them. If we are reconciled to God and are sure that he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness, as John wrote, then spread the good news. Share the gospel message. Where does reconciliation fit into the order of salvation? I'm not exactly sure. Whether it happens after repentance or if it happens after conversion or during perseverance, I don't claim to know. However, I do know that reconciliation is an element of salvation. And it's tied to atonement. Reconciliation is the end of alienation caused by sin between God and man. John Calvin describes reconciliation as the peace between humanity and God that is the result of the propitiation, that's a big word, propitiation, meaning payment for our sin, that removes sin and God's wrath. Evangelical theologian Philip Rankin describes reconciliation in this way. It's part of the message of salvation that brings us back together with God. God is the author, Christ is the agent, and the Holy Spirit is the ambassador of reconciliation. Other theologians have suggested that reconciliation is the focal point of all of Paul's letters and gives mankind peace with God. Now, scripture talks about the gift of Christ 
what was given, what he did, how he suffered and died on the cross as a gracious gift of love from God the Father. In this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent us his son to be a propitiation for our sins. 1 John 4.10 Though scripture speaks of reconciliation, it does not speak of God to man, but man to God, through the blood of Christ alone. So in the simplest language, a real atonement was offered to God by our Lord Jesus Christ without which, without this atonement, there could be no pardon from God for our sin. We must remember that Scripture does not speak of a reconciled God. Therefore, we do not believe that an atonement produced a change in the mind of God so as to turn him from hatred to love, for he loved his elect with everlasting love. Neither did the payment of for sin, procure his favor. Still, there was a sacrifice offered and propitiation made by which alone sin was pardoned and blotted out and forever put away. A.W. Pink says, By keeping these two things in mind, we will be better prepared to understand what reconciliation through the blood of the cross involves. There was no vindictive wrath or penal anger in the mind of God against his chosen. However, there was displeasure against our sin and against all of the elect for their sin. Do we remember how God was angry at Moses? He was angry with Aaron. He was angry with David. He was angry with Solomon for their personal sins, though they were all under the covenant of grace and loved by God with everlasting love. Scripture does speak of the anger and wrath of God, which is pacified only by the blood of the Lamb. See, sin is a violation of God's justice, and it breaks His holy law, and He, can, he cannot let sin pass. Adequate satisfaction must be made to His offended justice, or a pardon cannot be granted. So, we can see the necessity of why our Lord Jesus Christ had to be obedient and suffer and die for us. Because reconciliation hinges on the cross of Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection. By Christ obediently offering himself as a, sac a sacrifice for sin, a complete pardon is then rendered to the violated justice of God. This satisfies the law, and everlasting righteousness can be granted. With God's law being satisfied, man is then reconciled to God. God is gracious and faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us for all our unrighteousness. Without which there can be no reconciliation of man to God. It cannot, however... Make him love those he did not love from the beginning. For he loved the elect from all eternity in Christ, their covenant head. So the elect was defiled by sin and separated from God and needed to be washed in the blood of the Lamb. In this way, man was reconciled to God, the Father, by the cross of Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection, and the work of the Holy Spirit. To wrap things up, we go back to verse 17. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. John Chrysostom, a church father and excellent preacher, he served the church of Antioch and became the Baptist, the bishop, sorry, became the bishop of Constantinople in 397. Way back there, 397. He writes this, and he uses a lot of figurative language in his writing, and it often personalizes repentance effectively. But we must be careful 
to avoid thinking repentance is a praiseworthy work in and of itself. For instance, repentance as an external show does not obtain mercy from God as a reward. Still, when by grace the sinner's heart is changed and he believes in the Lord Jesus Christ, he lays hold of God's mercy through Christ's person and work. John Chrysostom wrote that repentance is never out of season. It's used as often as a skilled craftsman's tool or a soldier's weapon. He also comments that it is invaluable and most needed in this age that we live in. He goes on to write that repentance is purgative. He writes, fear not the working of this pill, smite your soul, smite it, and it will escape death by that stroke. Moist tears dry up sin and quench the wrath of God. We may clearly see the Spirit of God moving in the waters of one's tears. Repentance is the cherisher of piety and the procurer of mercy. Worldly tears fall on the earth, but godly tears are kept in heaven. Either sin must drown in our tears, or our soul will burn. It can be said that true repentance is, is a very difficult thing. However, things that are, are of excellence deserve our labor, don't they? Do we not toil daily for earthly gold, money, or paychecks? Do we not break a sweat at work? Is it not better to go to heaven with difficulty than to go to hell with ease? We should, while we are on this side of the grave, make peace with God, because tomorrow may be our dying day. Let this day be our repenting day. If we would imitate the saints of old, we would embitter our souls, sacrifice our own selfish desires and lusts, and put on sackcloth and ashes in hopes of one day wearing robes of white. Let us bow our heads, beloved, in prayer. Lord God, holy is your name above all names. May your kingdom come and may your will be done in our hearts. Turn our stony hearts to flesh. Let this day be our repenting day, if needs be. Lord, we pray for everyone in this room. We pray for every Christian around the world that's being persecuted for your namesake. Give them the strength to persevere. We thank you for this wonderful message from your holy word. May we take it to heart and understand what it truly means to be repentant. God, our Heavenly Father, you gave us eternal life through the death, burial, and resurrection of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus, our saving Lord, you came into a world darkened by man's sin and gave it light through your teaching and servanthood. Holy Spirit, the breath of God within us, you guide us and enlighten us and give us the strength to persevere. Father, we thank you for your love, the light of Christ, and the strength of the Holy Spirit. And we pray that in all we do and say that we honor you and continue your work here on earth. In your holy name.